Okay, we've gotten to one of the big ones, Night of the Living Dummy. Now, I wasn't a Goosebumps reader as a kid, but I knew about this one. That simple but striking cover, the playoff Night of the Living Dead. I knew about Slappy, the most iconic antagonist Goosebumps ever produced. Probably should have been the series mascot. Instead, they opted for some skeleton guy, who I don't think is actually in any of the books. Anyway, I finally got a copy of this thing. Time to see if it lives up to the hype. Alright, let's start with the back cover. Um, he's no dummy. I'm pretty sure that's factually incorrect, but moving on. Lindy names the ventriloquist dummy she finds Slappy. Oh, there he is. Slappy is kind of ugly, but he's a lot of fun. Lindy's having a great time learning to make Slappy move and talk. Oh, Scholastics knew they had a winner with Slappy. They used his name three times in three sentences. They're really promoting him. But Chris is jealous of all the attention her sister is getting. It's not fair. Why does Lindy always have all the luck? Oh, okay. Slappy sows the seeds of sibling rivalry. I like it. Chris decides to get a dummy of her own. She'll show Chris. Oh, I bet she will. And wait, hang on. Chris decides she'll show Chris. Chris will show Chris. Why does Chris want to show Chris? Did she? Do they mean? But Lindy had. Does Chris want to? Chris will show Chris. Chris will show Chris. Chris. Chris will show Chris. Chris will show Chris. Chris will show Chris. Give me Sorry, accidentally fell into a Mobius strip there. Night of the Living Dummy is the story of twin sisters, Lindy and Chris. They live with their mom, their dad, and their little dog, Barky, which I believe Forbes magazine listed as the worst dog name of the year 12 years running. We don't learn too much about these kids. They're sort of competitive. Chris is in a jewelry. Whew, I'm exhausted. That's enough characterization, right? On the assistance of their mother, the two girls go out on a bike ride, and they pass by a house under construction. Their curiosity getting the better of them, they explore the unfinished structure for a bit. And they find a spooky thing. Wait, no, it's a squirrel. There's nothing actually to this house. This is just establishing that there's construction going on nearby. After leaving, Lindy notices something in a dumpster. Then, slowly, she pulls something out. She started to hold it up. Its arms and legs dangled down, limply. Chris could see a head of brown hair. A head? Arms and legs? Oh no! Chris cried aloud, raising her hands to her face in horror. It's Casey Affleck! Throw him back in! No, it's a ventriloquist dummy, smartly dressed. And Lindy just imprints on the thing right away. She names it Slappy, and thus we meet the central antagonist of this book, the big bad, the main source of evil... Do I have to keep pretending like I haven't read the book to the end? Look, you're watching a Goosebumps video on a channel that occasionally has swearing in it. I have to assume you're old enough to have read this. You know that Slappy is not actually the villain of this piece. It's that kind of everyone knows that horror trivia along the lines of, hey, did you know Jason wasn't the villain in the first Friday the 13th movie? Or, I don't know, hey, did you know Super Mario Bros. 2 is a reskin Doki Doki Panic? Everybody knows that, Tom. I'm doing this up front because I think the more interesting discussion here is trying to figure out how aware R.L. Stein's classics were of Slappy's mascot potential. Slappy the dummy remains entirely inanimate till the end of the book. There's a second evil dummy that does all the stuff, and yet it's Slappy on the cover. Slappy gets name checked a lot in the summary in the back. Slappy is who this book is trying to sell. Which might be why this book didn't get adapted into an episode of the Goosebumps TV show. There's no technical reason why it didn't. It would probably be one of the cheaper stories to make. But since Slappy's not a major character in this story, they decided to skip to the one where he is. So Lindy brings Slappy home and starts practicing. And it turns out she has a natural talent for ventriloquism. 
Here's where most people would joke about how ventriloquism is a rubbish hobby for losers, but you know, fuck that. It's a skilled performance art that I can do. I picked the easy route of yelling at children's books for money. Hey, a 12-year-old girl just won America's Got Talent with her ventriloquism act. Good for you. I hope you continue a lucrative career in the thing you love and that more people become interested in it. Now, I do get why people are turned off by the classic image of a ventriloquist dummy. Dummies get into that uncanny valley area that unnerves people, which this book is totally trying to tap into. Which is also why you never see them anymore in actual professional ventriloquism performances. We all realize you get a better response with more cartoony, muppety characters. Hell, I think the only reason Edgar Bergen got as big as he did was because he did a lot of his work on radio. You can't see the dummies. Lindy starts showing off her dummy skills to the kids around town, and before you know it, she starts getting paying gigs for kids' birthday parties. The kids thought we were a riot, Lindy continued. She pulled Slappy up. Didn't they, Slappy? They liked me, hated you, Slappy declared in Lindy's high-pitched voice. I did a sing-along with Slappy and went over really well. Then Slappy and I did our rap routine. What a hit, Lindy gushed. We don't actually get to see any of these performances, which sucks, because there's nothing I want more than to see what a 12-year-old white girl in 1993 trying to rap with a ventriloquist dummy looks like. Well, Lindy's having a great old time, but Chris is miserable that her sister is finding success. She wants her own dummy, dammit. This is entirely motivated out of jealousy and some kind of innate have-to-do-the-same-things-as-my-sister-she's-not-allowed-to-have-her-own-thing quirk the twins have. The parents can't see that's what's going on, and Dad ends up buying another dummy from the pawn shop. He's cute, Chris said, searching for the right word. He looks just like Lindy's dummy, except his hair is bright red, not brown. The new dummy wore blue denim jeans and a red and green flannel shirt, and instead of the formal-looking shiny brown shoes, he had white high-top sneakers on his feet. Hey, uh, Chris, uh, sorry to break this to you, but I think your dummy is Carrot Top. Best to just throw it into the fire now. Chris names the dummy Mr. Wood because Slappy wasn't sexually innuendo -y enough. Lindy's not terribly happy about this. She sees this as her sister trying to take away what makes her special, and I frankly have to agree. Chris starts practicing with Mr. Wood, but finds it doesn't come as naturally to her as it does through his sister. Chris groaned. I need some good joke books, she said. That's all. Some good joke books with some really funny jokes. Then I'd be ready to perform. This would be an apt time to point out that Arl Stein himself wrote a bunch of children's jokes books, as well as a comedy guidebook called How to Be Funny. For a second, I was worried that this book was actually going to advertise some of Stein's joke books. Like I turned to the back and there'd be a thing, hey, don't be a dummy, freshen up your act with Arl Stein. That doesn't happen, and actually, the jokes in this book aren't that great. Anyway, time rolls on and strange things start to happen with Mr. Wood. The dummy goes missing from time to time, and, and Chris finds him in weirder and weirder situations. Like she finds him wearing her clothes and jewelry, which probably means that if you have a living dummy situation on your hands, you should ditch the Mr. part of the name until you get the okay on Wood's pronouns. This reaches its peak when Lindy is woken up by Chris' scream. Going downstairs into the kitchen, Lindy finds a truly weird sight. The refrigerator door was wide open, and the refrigerator was empty. Everything inside had been pulled out and dumped onto the kitchen floor. An orange juice bottle lay on its side in a puddle of orange juice. Eggs were scattered everywhere. Fruits and vegetables were strewn over the floor. Everything seemed to sparkle and gleam. What was all that shiny stuff among the food? Chris's jewelry! There were earrings and bracelets and strands of beads tossed everywhere, mixed with the spilled strewn food like some kind of bizarre salad. Sitting upright in the middle of the mess was Mr. Wood, grinning gleefully at her. He had several strands of beads around his neck, long dangling earrings hanging from his ears, and a platter of leftover chicken on his lap. Well, Mom comes down, sees this mess, and assumes the girls did it. She is rightfully angry and threatens to take both of the dummies away. But the girls plead and promise to clean it up and pay for all the food, and Mom eventually backs off. They clean up. Chris is clearly unnerved. She is stressing out over Mr. Wood maybe actually being alive, which is when Lindy finally speaks up. This was all her doing. Dun dun dun. Yes, the first two thirds of the book have been Lindy just messing with Chris's head to get back at her for stealing her ventriloquism hobby. Now, 
A for effort. Lindy put Mr. Wood in some weird and unnerving situations, and I'm even mad that there wasn't actually a living dummy running around this whole time. The problem is that, well, remember that kitchen scene I just read? That's from Lindy's perspective. It's her internal voice, so she shouldn't be surprised by the mess that she created, but the book treats it like it's her first time seeing it. The book is being directly dishonest with its readers to hide its mystery, and I'm not down with that. There's no reason to flip between the two sisters' perspectives. Chris is good enough as a point of view character. We could have had her reaction to the mess, but Arl Stein really just wanted to lie to some kids. This is bad writing. Lindy doesn't really get punished for this prank stuff either. At the very least, Chris shouldn't be splitting the bill for all that food that Lindy ruined. With Lindy's confession, things effectively reset. The girls are still doing ventriloquism gigs. Chris gets a spot in the opening act of the school concert. We don't actually see her get the spot, she just tells Lindy in a way that makes me think she was making it up to try to sound like her act was getting noticed as much as Lindy's. While practicing in front of the mirror, Chris discovers a note in Mr. Wood's pocket. Well, 82 pages into this 134 page book, we finally have our inciting incident. That dummy is alive. We get a scene where an old couple comes to visit, and the parents force the twins to perform their acts in front of them, because the only reason to have kids is for them to be your singing, dancing monkeys. Lindy's act goes over well. Shame we don't actually get to see it. But when Chris starts hers, Mr. Wood just starts insulting the old couple. Not even good insults, just stuff like, man, your teeth are yellow and gross. Chris gets in trouble, but she says she didn't do it, that Mr. Wood said that stuff on his own. Then comes a school concert, with Chris as the opening act and it starts off pretty much the same way. Mr. Wood insults the weight of one of the teachers, everyone gets mad, second verse, same as the first, and then the dummy vomits. Chris froze in horror, staring as more and more of the disgusting substance poured from her dummy's gaping mouth. A putrid stench, a smell of sour milk, of rotten eggs, of burning rubber, of decayed meat, rose up from the liquid. It puddled over the stage and showered over the front seats. Now, Mr. Wood doesn't go exorcist vomit scene. He goes Team America vomit scene. It's surreal. How does this even work? Okay, so it was those words Chris read that brought Mr. Wood to life, but I don't think those words gave him a working stomach in which to hold bile. What exactly is generating all this puke? Well, Chris is in super trouble, not just with her parents. She's facing possible suspension from school. Nobody asks. No, really, how did you hide 10 gallons of rotten soup inside that dummy? How did you spray it out with the force of a fire hose? The parents shove the dummy in a closet and decide to sleep on the situation to calm down. However, as soon as the parents are asleep, Mr. Wood comes out to play, revealing his sentience to Chris for the first time. But you're a dummy, she squealed. He giggled again. So are you, he replied. His voice was a deep growl, like an angry snarl of a dog. You can't walk, Chris cried, her voice trembling. The dummy giggled its ugly giggle again. You can't be alive, Chris exclaimed. Let go of me, now, the dummy growled. Chris held on, tightening her grip. I'm dreaming, Chris told herself aloud. I have to be dreaming. I'm not a dream, I'm a nightmare, the dummy exclaimed and tossed back his wooden head, laughing. Chris struggles with Mr. Wood, which wakes up the entire family. More parents yelling at kids, it never ever stops. But now Lindy discovers Mr. Wood is alive. Now there really isn't much to Mr. Wood. He's unpredictable, but beyond that he doesn't seem to be much of a threat. He's not strong enough to not have two tiny girls manhandle him and trap him in a suitcase without much struggle. He threatens the kids by saying he has magic powers, but outside of projectile vomit we never see any powers. He calls the girls his slaves, tells them they have to do what he says or he'll hurt their loved ones. But this guy is so light and weak, if he tried attacking mom and dad with, I don't know, scissors or something, they'd probably punt him across the room. Physically, he's about as threatening as a three-year-old. His one advantage, that of pretending to be an inanimate object, isn't going to hold much longer because the parents are already dead set on getting rid of the dummy as punishment for Chris. Mr. Wood does not have a strong hand here. Still, Chris and Lindy have to deal with their little invader. We have no choice. We have to kill him, Lindy. Huh? Her sister's face filled with surprise. Chris grabbed the dummy by the shoulders and held him tightly. 
I'll hold him. You pull his head off. Whoa! We went from 0 to 90 in 3.7 seconds. This little guy is causing us trouble. Let's murder him. I know Mr. Wood is threatening them, but it's still a living creature you're trying to tear the head off of. Alas, Mr. Wood is made of stern stuff, so they try cutting his head off with scissors. Seeing as how he's solid wood, that doesn't really do much. Finally, they stuff him in a suitcase, go to that house construction in the middle of the night, and bury him in a pile of dirt. Not in a hole in the ground, a pile of dirt that was guaranteed to be disturbed by the people building this house. Next morning, surprise, he got out, he's back, he's in the living room. But we put him under so much loose dirt. Maybe we should have sprinkled some flower petals on top to weigh it down. Mr. Wood isn't happy, and he tries to strangle Barky the dog right in front of the girls. The twins grab him and take him outside, struggle with him, trying to find some way to put him down. The fight eventually bleeds into the construction area, where bulldozers and steamrollers are laying down some foundation. After a few close calls, Mr. Wood falls in front of the steamroller and gets crushed, a stinky green gas coming from his crushed little body. The driver of the steamroller at first thinks he ran over a kid, and the poor guy nearly has a heart attack. But the girls reassure him, it was just a ventriloquism dummy. We ran out here in our pajamas and threw a ventriloquist dummy in front of your heavy machinery. No, no big deal. It seems we've all learned a valuable lesson in... Wait, wait, did we learn anything? However, when they get back inside, they find this waiting for them. As she leaned over the chair to grab the window frame, Slappy reached over the chair and grabbed her arm. Hey, slave, is that other guy gone? The dummy asked in a throaty voice. I thought he'd never leave. And thus, Slappy, the most iconic character in Goosebumps, is... Born, I guess? We'll be seeing him again 24 books later. So that's Night of the Living Dummy. It's not a disaster, I guess, but for a book I always assumed to be one of the series' most iconic, there's not a whole lot under the hood. No, I'm not mad that Slappy isn't really in it. I'm not upset that the first two-thirds of the book has nothing supernatural going on. The pranks Lindy manages to pull off is actually more unnerving than the actual Mr. Wood stuff, and it's a better ratio of natural versus supernatural than, say, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. The problem here is that the book doesn't seem all that interested in its own premise. It can't seem to think of anything really creative to do with it. First, like, why use ventriloquism dummies over something like living dolls? The answer might just be, everybody already thinks they're creepy, which, okay, fair enough, Stein wasn't the first to realize that. But you know, you can't take a premise and explore it a bit. Ventriloquism is associated with comedy, why not try to make a horror comedy? You wrote multiple joke books, Stein. Surely you got some leftovers you could use. The fact that there are very few jokes in a book about two girls who both take up stand-up comedy hobbies is weird. And Mr. Wood, once alive, doesn't crack a single joke. In fact, Mr. Wood is pretty boring as antagonists go. He just calls the girls slaves over and over again. He claims to have powers that never appear. He never really comes off as a threat. If there's one word I would use to describe this book, it would be, so? Hey, these girls decide to become ventriloquists. So? We don't get to see their acts. Lindy is playing pranks on her sister. So? Nothing comes of it. Mr. Wood is alive. So? He's no threat to anybody. Slappy is alive. So? Combine that with the book's dishonesty when haphazardly switching to Lindy's perspective, and you end up with a book that feels much more like filler. Like something pushed out real quick without much thought. Way more so than the book's iconic status would seem to suggest. I suppose this is the part of the video where I tell you what I would have done if I was writing the book. Well, without adding or removing any elements, with keeping the book's final twist alive... Okay, I got it. The book starts out the same. Lindy finds Slappy in the dumpster, becomes a ventriloquist, Chris gets jealous, asks for a dummy of her own, Dad buys her Mr. Wood. Now, Mr. Wood becomes alive right away. Either Chris reads the magic words earlier, or Mr. Wood was always alive. He reveals he's alive to Chris, but he isn't hostile. In fact, he wants to be Chris's friend. Once the shock of a living dummy fades away, Chris confides in Mr. Wood that she's super jealous of Lindy and wants to be better than her. Oh, says Mr. Wood, I can help with that. Just leave the jokes to me. And then Chris does her act, and she kills. Her jokes are amazing. She might even be more popular than Lindy. Mr. Wood starts acting like a little shoulder devil, feeding into Chris's insecurities, and he intensifies the twins' rivalry. 
Hey, Chris, she's going to wear that for her performance with Slappy. Be a shame if someone took some scissors to that dress. Eventually, Chris reaches a moral line she won't cross. She breaks down, realizes Mr. Wood has been manipulating her, and tries to make amends with Lindy. But Mr. Wood won't have that. The book ends in a similar manner. Mr. Wood gets violent. Chris and Lindy have to work together to put him down. Under the steamroller you go. And then the twist. Not only is Slappy alive, he was alive this entire time, manipulating Lindy in the exact same way Mr. Wood was manipulating Chris. I didn't add or remove any characters. I didn't even really change the order of events that much. A lot of what writing is, is recognizing what you have and making something of it. I have a sibling rivalry and I have living puppets. Can I make those things work together thematically? What do the dummies symbolize in my story? What are the relationships between these characters and how do those events change those relationships? You don't want, so, you want, Oh, I give Night of the Living Dummy an Arlstein joke book out of 10.